In a moment, I will pass the presentation over to Fred Durso. Fred is the communications manager for the Fire Sprinkler Initiative for the National Fire Protection Association. He will give you a description of today's objectives and then introduce you to our presenter for today's session. And Fred, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Susan, and good morning, good afternoon, everybody, depending on your time zone. I am Fred Durso, Communications Manager for NFPA's Fire Sprinkler Initiative, and before I introduce today's presenter, I wanted to just give a brief overview of the Fire Sprinkler Initiative for those that might be unfamiliar with it. It was started in 2009 by NFPA to increase uh, the use of home fire sprinklers via the adoption of sprinkler requirements in new homes, and we see sprinklers as the solution to the home fire problem, both in the U.S. and Canada, where the majority of fire deaths are still occurring uh, at home. So our website, for those that are unfamiliar with it, I'm going to place the URL in the, in the chat box right now, uh, provides a really healthy array of resources, research, uh, advocacy tools that give the fire service, as well as sprinkler advocates, um, the information they need to make a really convincing case for sprinkler requirements, whether that's for the, your legislators, your code-making bodies, or even for the public. So while the Fire Sprinkler Initiative uh, focuses on advocating for sprinkler requirements, the Home Fire Sprinkler Coalition, HFFC, is strictly an educational endeavor. So NFPA is a founding member of the uh, Home Fire Sprinkler Coalition, which is comprised of other top fire and life safety organizations and insurer, insurers excuse me, uh, that produce, again, strictly educational materials on home fire sprinklers that are all completely free. Um, so your presenter today, Peg Paul, has been communications manager for HFFC since 1997. She has worked with HFFC's board to develop educational programs and really great uh, materials for members of the home building industry, the fire service, water purveyors, real estate, and insurance agents and consumers. So Peg currently also serves on boards for the International Association of uh, Fire Chiefs and with the Phoenix Society for Burn Survivors. And she also lives in a home protected by, uh, by fire sprinklers. So without further ado, I'll pass the time over to you, Thank you, Fred. And hello, everyone. Um, today, in addition to talking about our challenges and um, identifying stakeholders, I'm going to talk about a new study. And it comes out of Johns Hopkins. And it's research that shows that people do value and support home fire sprinklers once they know the facts and once they, they become informed. So some good information. And then um, at the end of the presentation, I'm going to talk about HFSC's free resources. OK. Um, so first of all, as Fred mentioned, uh, the coalition is the educational group. Home Fire Sprinkler Coalition is a nonprofit 501c3, and we were founded in 1996. Fred mentioned that. Um, I've worked with the group since um, um, 97, and it's been a wonderful group, a wonderful board. Um, a lot of good things have come out of it. Um, and we do not get involved in the code process. That is what the initiative is for. So we work hand in hand. Um, go to that group when you need help with legislative code issues. Come to the coalition when you need education and you need res resources to educate. Um, even though HFSC is not involved with the code process, we all know that it takes education um, to get there. So that's what we're there for. We're the leading resource for independent, non-commercial information about home fire sprinklers. And why do we need to educate? Well, we all know every new home built without fire sprinklers is a lost opportunity to save lives and prevent injuries. And I think um, all of you um, here today would agree. It's frustrating when you go through past a home that's under construction, you know it's not going to be sprinklered. And we all know the biggest challenge is dispelling myths and misinformation. And there's a lot of that out there. And the biggest myth across the board, whether it's consumers, home buyers, realtors, builders, people in the water industry, um, you know, it's, they're all going to go off at once. Um, activated by smoke is also a big myth. A lot of people think if their smoke alarms went off, it would set off a sprinkler system. Cost, there's a lot of misinformation about cost. Um, appearance is a concern, but actually that's gone down quite a bit over the years. Um, people don't seem as concerned, I think, because there are concealed sprinklers in a lot of commercial office buildings. Um, and a lot of confusion 
information about insurance discounts and that type of information, even from the insurance industry. We're lucky to have State Farm on our board to help us with that. Um, but just going back, if in any of your educational efforts, whoever your audience is, if you're successful at educating them so that they understand that they don't all go off at once, that each sprinkler is individually activated by heat, then I would consider that success. So let's just start off by talking about some of the challenges. Um, of course, especially when the economy was down, limited budget for all of your public, your pub ed um, programs. Um, a lot of um, fire departments did take cuts with their personnel, so um, having the right staff and the people there to um, implement the programs, that has been a challenge. I add to this few or no qualified installers. That can be a challenge for you as well. It is frustrating for the coalition when we get a phone call or through our website um, a homeowner who's planning to build a new home and they just cannot find an installer in, in their area and that, you know, it's a supply and demand type issue. If, if they're not required, um, there may not be an installer, so that can be a challenge for you. And code activity. If you're in an area where it's time to update your codes um, or you're looking at ordinance, suddenly there's a lot of anti-sprinkler activity going on and that may put you in a defensive mode. So we want to make sure that you have access to all the facts and the resources so that you're prepared to deal with that. Now challenges with, the, with builder resistance. Builders do believe that um, fire sprinklers are costly and they do not want to add to the cost of the home. That's their biggest issue with sprinklers being um, required. Um, every year for about, it's been over 15 years, Home Fire Sprinkler Coalition has been at the International Builder Show. We were just there two weeks ago. And um, there are a lot of misinformed builders and when they come and talk to us, once they understand the facts, we do see a change in attitude. But what they do believe is that smoke alarms are enough, that there is no need for sprinklers. Um, they do believe that new homes don't burn, they just don't understand. Um, and when we have anti-sprinkler efforts, you end up with misinformed consumers, misinformed media. It's very frustrating when um, the wrong information is sent to the media and then they turn around and report that. And you have misinformed home buyers and decision makers. Now, water purveyors. We have some parts of the country where um, the water purveyors, the water utilities, have been even more of a challenge than the building industry. Um, and it really comes down to lack of awareness about home fire sprinkler facts and requirements. Um, a lot of uh, people in the water industry that have never seen a 13D system, a single family home, they um, think they know about commercial systems. They think the system needs a separate water line. They don't realize that really the system is an extension of the domestic water supply. So um, it's important to educate them. And the other frustration that we'll hear is high tap fees, which penalize the homeowners. So um, we need to educate the, the water purveyors so that we can eliminate that um, tap fee. So I'm sharing this with you today um, because we know that consumers want fire sprinklers once they understand them. And this is a real quote. This is from Lisa. That's her in the photo. And she's a real estate agent in Glen Ellen, Illinois, where sprinklers have been required for quite a few years. And so as a real estate agent, a mother of two, her and her husband raised their daughters in a sprinklered home. And Lisa gets it. She understands how they work. And now she sells a lot of homes that are sprinklered. So it's a realtor selling existing sprinklered homes. And she says, I'm a realtor and a mother, and I love to sell sprinklered homes, especially to buyers with kids. And because she understands the marketing opportunity, she knows the added value when she is showing someone a sprinklered home. And she knows how to answer their questions because she'll have a lot of home buyers who will come in and they'll ask the question, won't they go off at once? Do I have to worry about flooding? So it's important that we have realtors like Lee who knows how to answer those questions. Now, the Home Fire Sprinkler Coalition with Fire Act grant funding was able to do a Harris poll, and this was in 2014, and uh, we actually talked to over a thousand homeowners. And what we learned is information is key. Uh, first, we surveyed the homeowners just on their sprinkler knowledge. We wanted a sense of what they knew, and after um, we collected that information, then we educated them a little bit. We gave them some basic information about how sprinklers work, um, some cost information, 
and then we asked the questions again. And what we learned was without the information, 52% felt sprinklers were important. But after they learned the facts about sprinklers, it shot up 26% and we had 78% who felt sprinklers were important. So what we really learned from this is once they understand sprinklers, they're accepting of it. Now the other thing we learned from the Harris poll was 74% were more likely to buy a home with fire sprinklers. 98% understood that fires can happen no matter what. So it wasn't that fires only happen in old homes. They understood that that it really is people's behavior and prevention and, and the other factors. 78% say fire sprinklers provide the ultimate fire protection. So they understood the difference between the smoke, al smoke alarms warn you and sprinklers start working on that fire. 70% say sprinkler, a sprinklered home has more value than homes without sprinklers. So that's real important when we're talking to the realtors in the home building industry that once consumers get it, they want it, they understand the value. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, Johns Hopkins just released a study at the end of last year, and they actually um, talked to 976 people who live in sprinklered homes and 1,357 people who live in unsprinklered homes. And um, they really surveyed them to find out what their attitudes were. And what they found was 75% of those who lived in the sprinklered homes we're more likely to buy a home with fire sprinklers in the future compared to 30% of those in non-sprinklered homes who didn't feel that same way. 70% um, of the people who lived in sprinklered homes said that they would pay for sprinklers. 40% non-sprinklers said that they would pay for them. 48% versus 19% expressed a higher level of support for policies to mandate sprinklers in all new homes. So again, this was comparing people who live in sprinklered homes and they had more of an understanding compared to people who really didn't know information about sprinklers and um, live in unsprinklered homes. So I did put a copy of this study on the HFSC website. It's under the fire service page and it's a PDF and you should be able to view it and I think you can download it as well. But some good information. Now, other information that HFSC has been using in a lot of our educational material comes out of UL NIST research. Again, a lot of this was funded through FEMA Fire Act grant funding. And um, there are three key points that we talk about. Um, the first is what our homes are made out of. Fires burn faster in newer homes, and they can be deadlier because homes are built out of lightweight construction, and they're designed with open construction. And they create a more dangerous condition faster, and they can fail sooner compared to older dimensional lumber systems. And what we like to remind people is there are two factors here. Number one, occupants don't have as much time to get out of the fire. Um, and number two, the safety of the firefighters when they arrive at the scene. Fires in new homes burn faster. Um, reason number two, airtight construction. We build energy efficient homes, which changes the behavior of the fire. Um, our energy conserving materials, such as our double glazed windows and our synthetic insulation material, um, they all make for faster spreading fires. And the third reason is the content we have in our home. And that's a factor whether it's an older home or a newer home built out of today's construction materials. Um, our polyurethane foam that fills our couches and our other synthetic objects, all of that can cause flashover and very poisonous poisonous billowing smoke. And this image that I have on the slide actually comes out of the research that ULNIS did. If you're not familiar with it, you can find it on their website. Um, they had built two, or they have two rooms here. And the one on the left has legacy furniture that's made out of natural fiber furniture. And the room on the right is, the, is today's modern furniture that has a lot of those synthetic materials in it. And as you can see down at the bottom, at about two and a half minutes, you have that fire and it's shortly after that that flashover occurred and if you watch the video um, the time lapse goes to over 20 minutes before you finally have flash flashover in the legacy furniture so some some very important information came out of that. 
Now, cost assessment research. Um, the Fire Protection Research Foundation did a study twice, once in 08 and once in 2013, and I was proud to be on that panel. It was an interesting um, process both years. But what they looked at was all costs to the builder, all costs to the builder, including the design, installation, permits, any additional equipment, um, increased tap and water meter fees, anything involved in putting the 13D system in. And what they found in 08 was that it came out to $1.61 per sprinklered square foot. And when they did the study again a couple years later in 2013, it actually dropped down. And we believe that has to do with supply and demand. And it dropped down to $1.35 per sprinklered square foot. And I thought I would just share with you um, the, the, what happened in those two years. The first year, they went into 10 communities. The second year, they went, or in 2013, they went into 17 communities. And some of them were the same when they went in the second year, not all of them. Um, number of homes, they looked at the costs in 30 homes in 08, 51 homes in 2013. And then the next two lines really compare the homes that were on a municipal water supply um, versus um, stored tank and pump type system. And then finally, they were kind of across the board. They wanted to look at homes that had basements, um, homes built on a slab, and crawl space. So they really were across the board in terms of analyzing um, the systems and all of the costs. Now, HFSC, we've been involved with um, putting some um, very important information together. Um, as, as I mentioned, we were founded 20 years ago in 96. And one of the first things we did when the, when the coalition was um, founded was we worked with Scottsdale and put together the Scottsdale report. Um, many of you know Jim Ford, and he is still with Scottsdale. And he was smart enough to collect data from the very beginning, 1986, when Scottsdale did pass an ordinance requiring sprinklers in all new single family homes. And 10 years later, was able to analyze that data and put the report together together with HFSC and basically compared sprinklered versus unsprinklered in terms of death rates. There were no um, deaths in the sprinklered homes, average fire loss, and water damage. And that has been really good information. And after that, in 2009, we actually worked with Prince George's County and developed um, a study with them. Same type of thing, a lot of detailed information in all of these reports. And then in 2011, we worked with Bucks County up in Pennsylvania and all the communities in that county that require sprinklers as well. And all of the um, information is parallel. And so um, a lot of good stuff. So if you're not familiar with it, if you go onto our website, all three reports are up there. In fact, Scottsdale was originally a 10-year report. And I have up here five years later than we did um, a 15-year update. So um, please go to our website, and you can download all of these as well. A lot of good information, especially when you're talking to the decision makers in your community. Another important study, and this was with FM Global, um, protect our Earth one home at a time is our tagline. Um, and it, it was a study, the environmental impact of automatic fire sprinklers. And what had happened was um, FM Global built two 20 by 20 foot rooms. In one of the rooms, they put one, a single sprinkler up in the ceiling. And um, they started fires. The furniture was identical. And it represented, uh, represented a modern, typical living room today. And um, they allowed the fires to burn for 10 minutes before they sent firefighters in. And they collected the smoke and the water. And they went in and did an analysis of the, um, uh, of the burn damage, the fire damage. But what they found was that sprinklers reduced greenhouse gases by 98%. They reduced water usage by up to 91%. And reduced fire damage by up to 97% and reduced water pollution. So a very interesting study. It was the first time we had real scientific data behind the green part of the story. We always assumed all of, all of these things. Um, you can get the study on FM Global's page. They also are a website. And they also have a um, three or four minute video that um, summarizes the data as well. Now, um, these are really all of the stakeholders that are involved in, um, in 
the education process. And what we encourage fire departments to do is, um, you know, really think about your challenges. Um, you know, what is going on right now in your community? And, um, you know, where do you need to be? And the only thing that is not included on here is, um, um, I should have put elected officials or decision makers because we educate them and have materials for them as well. But um, when you go through just consumers as a whole, you can really break that up into various target audiences, again, deciding on what's going on. First of all, you would like to educate everybody in your, your community. Wouldn't it be nice if everybody knew that you could put sprinklers in a home and um, that they wouldn't all go off at once? Well, you know, that would be wonderful. Um, but um, especially if you're in an area where you have housing starts again, um, I know there are some communities where um, the housing starts are based on tear down and rebuild communities, um, but the end result is you do have people that um, are planning to build and move into new homes, um, and that that could be a separate group. We also like to focus on parents with young children and older adults, since those are two um, high risk groups of dying in a house fire. Um, the home building industry, um, we urge you to know who the builders are who are allowed to build in your community. You know, find out if you don't know already who they are and think about how you can communicate with them. The fire service, yep, that's most of you um, here today. Um, you know, make sure that uh, residential sprinklers are a part of your education process starting at your cadet program. All firefighters who work with you, volunteer, career, any firefighter that works with you really should know the facts about sprinklers in general and specifically about home fire sprinklers. Um, sprinkler installers, again, I talked about them earlier. Um, I think it's good for all fire departments to know who they are and who does residential work. Um, they're also a great partner for you when you do, um, I'll talk about it in a minute, side-by-side -side burn, burn demonstrations or just there to answer questions. I know you want to stay away from recommending a certain contractor, but if at least you have a list available, that is good for the people in your community. Um, I talked about LEATSA earlier, real estate agents. Know your real estate agents in your area, in your district. Know um, where their offices are, get to know them, especially if now you have sprinklered homes that you need to sell. Insurance agents, we have State Farm on our board and they have um, really helped us in putting the right messaging together for insurance agents, but there are a lot out there who um, do not understand sprinklers and so if you can help educate the ones in your jurisdiction, um, that would be wonderful. Uh, we talked about the water purveyors, whether you have a private water company or um, it's public part of your city, town, um, they need to be educated. And building officials, local officials, decision makers, again, it depends on what is going on in your area, whether you're looking at code updates, they do need to be educated. Now, educational activities, I just listed a few here. There are so many that you can do, but these seem to be the most successful based on the fire departments that we've worked with and the feedback that we have received. And number one are the side-by-side -side fire and sprinkler burn demonstrations. Um, HFSC has a kit if you're not familiar with it, and I refer to it as turnkey, short of giving you all of the material, because it has all of the instructions um, everything you need to conduct a side-by-side -side burn. The talking points, if you're the moderator, we have press releases in there that you can localize to send to your media. We have um, letters in there that you could use to invite decision makers, local officials. Um, we even give talking points and tips if you're talking to a younger group because we know you should probably talk to children differently um, because they can oftentimes be fearful if they see flashover in a burning room, but the side-by-side -side, um, demonstration, two eight-by-eight-foot rooms, one is sprinklered, and it allows your community to see up close and personal how quickly flashover occurs, um, how damaging, how frightening it is, and then it, it allows people to see firsthand how sprinkler operates. So this has been extremely successful, and um, Thousands have been done um, coast to coast up in Canada and it's just good to see and we get a lot of excellent feedback. Um, of course, sprinkler um, trailer demonstrations, they have been around for years and they are wonderful um, because you can 
you can pretty much bring it anywhere. And um, again, it allows people to see fire and see a sprinkler activity. I always remember we were doing a habitat project in Bloomington, Illinois. And um, we sprinklered all the habitat homes. And the family came to learn about sprinklers. And we ended it with them coming out to the um, trailer so they could see what would happen if they had a fire in their home. And they asked us to keep doing it over and over again. So we brought the trailer to the habitat home. Um, builder real estate agent home safety programs, what could you be doing? We've talked to fire departments over the years that invited builders for a luncheon in their training rooms at the fire department. And at that point, they would also invite any local sprinkler contractors to answer questions and get to know them. Um, real estate agents as well, or invite all of them, the builders and their real estate agents. Um, Living with Sprinklers, Home Buyer. This is a program, um, I mentioned Habitat. That's where we've done it a few times, where um, when the family is ready to move in, we actually come out there and do an education program with the fire department, where we would show them HFSC's Living with Sprinkler video. It's a five minute video where they could understand they either don't all go off at once. We show them how to do a flow check test, a flow test. Um, answer their questions, remind them not to hang things from the sprinkler, not to paint them. And that can really be done in any home, but the Habitat um, provided a wonderful opportunity to invite the media as well. Um, and as I mentioned with Habitat, the other thing we have done is what we would call behind the walls with the Habitat projects. This could be homes for our troops or any model home if you're working with a builder. Um, after the sprinkler system goes in, but before the house is done, invite the local builders, invite the media, um, invite uh, local officials again, anybody, the water purveyors, any of those stakeholders into that home and take them on a tour. Let them see the system before the walls are up and you can't see it. And it really has been a wonderful educational opportunity. Um, vocational school program, this actually started when HFSC had stipend money from um, FEMA grants. We're hoping we'll continue this in the future. But um, what would happen is the fire department would um, partner with a vocational school. And HFSC has the tools, including an online course and quizzes. And so the students in the vocational school who are our future home builders and um, the tradespeople would learn about sprinklers. They would build a side-by-side. -side, and usually at the end of the program, um, they, the fire department would invite those students to watch the side-by-side -side burn, invite the community. Um, HFSC can actually do personalized certificates to hand out to those students. Um, and we do know of a couple of vocational schools who have now made that program part of their permanent curriculum. So um, if you're interested, um, I can share with you, and we do have on our website all the components for that program. Think about home shows if you haven't done them. Home shows are another great opportunity um, because uh, usually they are sponsored by your local home builders, so you have that audience there, and you have um, uh, your community. A lot of them are do-it-yourself people. They're looking for home improvement type things. But you do get a percentage of people who go to home shows because they are planning sometime in the near future to build a new home. So a wonderful um, chance to talk to those people about sprinklers and set up a booth. HFSC has displays. We have an interactive game. A lot of different tools that fire departments can use if they decide to set up a booth at a local home show. And finally, website, social media. Um, where, you know, what are, how active are you with your social media? Do you put a lot of um, educational material on your website? Well, we encourage you to use HFSC's material. We have um, 3D graphics um, linked to us if that's easier. Um, we have public service announcements that you could um, put on your website. And we have a lot of stuff that you can use to just support any other social media outreach you do through Facebook or if you're tweeting. Um, anything that you're doing and you want some visual support, uh, we encourage you to use all of our, our material. Um, we are going to be doing, HFSC is going to be doing a survey soon with fire departments because we're curious to know what type of social media activity you do do. And so we want to learn more about 
impact um, that as well. And so we are going to be surveying the fire departments who are um, signed up for our Built for Life Fire Department program. If you are not, please do. It's free. All, all it's doing is allowing us to have a database so that we can learn from you, which is what we want to do now with the social media. Um, when we are developing new material, um, we ask you to review it. Uh, a few years ago when we put that side-by-side -side kit together, we had a huge high response from these Built for Life fire departments who went through all of our material and made excellent um, comments. And um, as a result, it was probably one of the best tools we ever put together, and that's because of these fire departments signed up for Built for Life. Also, if we are able to do another stipend program soon, um, you have to be signed up for the Built for Life Fire Department to apply for those stipends. So right now we're at approximately 2,800 fire departments signed up for the program. Go onto our website and click on the application to sign up. And again, it's free. It's just um, a, 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 an opportunity for all of us to communicate with each other, which we plan on doing more of that. I touched on um, a lot of our resources. Um, the one resource that I hope you'll all take advantage of is our media fact sheet. And on our website, it is in our media room. And it addresses all of the different issues that HFSC has heard over the years, questions from the media, um, basic facts, um, really everything that you need and that you can put into your media, you know, take it and make it your media fact sheet. Um, add your local information if you'd like. Um, the media room also has some press releases. You can do the same thing. I mentioned our graphics and our 3D animation. One of my favorite is, favorites is an animated um, sprinkler. It shows how when um, you have heat from the fire, um, when it gets up to about 160 degrees, we see the bulb burst and the sprinkler activate. Um, you are welcome to download it and use it however you want to. It's a, it's a great educational tool. Um, banners and displays, I mentioned you can use those if you do home shows or if you're doing any type of education. Um, we're happy to send it out to you. We do need it back because we share it. And we have a few different messages, with whether it's our green message, um, basic sprinkler information. We have a fire chart that shows how quickly um, fires become deadly. And we call it our flashover chart. So um, you know, please take advantage of that. I mentioned the municipal reports. Um, go onto our website and download those. And it would take me an hour to go through all of our material, but we have educational material for all of those stakeholders that we talked about earlier, all of them. And um, they are on our website. We are in the process of going digital with all of our educational material. And um, so we are planning on um, uh, redoing our um, YouTube channel and our entire website. We're moving to a different platform because we want to make it easier for those who are putting their education programs together to find our material, figure out what we have for their stakeholders, and um, download it and uh, use it in your various presentations. And I mentioned the public service announcements. Um, one of my favorites is um, we have an animated piece that really attacks Hollywood for having all sprinklers go off at once. If you're a built for life fire department and you want to use them, um, use them in um, movie theaters, that was a big one. Um, we can localize it for you. If you give us your fire department logo, we're happy to put it at the end. If it needs to be um, certain specifications to play at the movie theater, um, we'll adapt to that. And so we'll do whatever we can to help you use our material um, in your programs. So uh, those are our various resources, lots of good studies. I uh, was excited to see that new study that came out of Johns Hopkins. Um, if you need to contact us, that's our toll-free number. If you send an email to info at homefiresprinkler.org, it will come to me. And um, so whatever you need, if you are planning on doing the vocational program and you need some help with that, I mentioned that um, that material is on our website, but I'm also happy to help you out with that. And if you go to our website, everything is there. It's filled with information. And um, in a couple months, we will be excited to launch our new and improved website. And it'll be the same URL, homefiresprinkler.org. 
please like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and on LinkedIn. So if you're not already, we, um, we like likes, so please do that. So thank you very much for this opportunity to um, talk to you today. And uh, again, send me an email if you have any questions, call us. What HFSC likes to do is work with the fire departments and make sure you understand what our resources are and help and how we can help you um, with your challenges so and much, identify Jake. your stakeholders we and make sure you have the tools the that are already the there to help the you. Bottom of the hour, so for anybody who can stay, we'll begin doing our question and answer session. I logged all of your questions and comments and I'll be fielding those to Peg. For anybody who cannot stay, a recording and PDF of today's webinar as well as answers to the questions will be available in approximately three weeks. I put the link in our chat window for you. It will be available at firesprinklerinitiative.org. So Peg, I'll go ahead and just start funneling the questions and comments to you. We actually have more comments than questions, really insightful comments, and so I think I'd like to, you know, field those to you as well. Just in, you might be able to add to the comments that people made. So the first one is, is there a downside to using a 13D multipurpose system? Well, I am not a technical person, and um, the coalition itself, we just really um, stand behind any approved system um, that is a 13D system, whether it's a multi-purpose, a standalone system, and so I'm not aware of any um, downsides. That may be a question that could come, or Matt Klaus, perhaps, from NFPA could answer that question. Um, okay, thanks, Peg. Again, HFSC, we just tried to is, educate do you have any on data from any the website that's part of 13D. That, the Harris poll that breaks down respondent locations. Um, I'll have to go in and check that. It's it's a two-year study, and there was a lot of information in there. But whether it broke down into the different markets, that's a good question. I'll have to whoever asked that question. Um, if you want to send me an email, I'll see if I can answer that. Um, I'm not sure how else I could get that out to anyone, so that may be a good starting point. Hey, Peg, uh, we had also been communicating with Fred through the moderators tab of the chat panel, and he mentioned that we could post answers as well to okay. the website, so that, you know, another option for folks to be able to get those answers. Great, I'll and see if I can get that answer. All right, thank you very much. And some of these questions and comments, other participants either provided answers or did additional comments, but you know, because it's often hard to look at the chat window during the session, I want to go ahead and just ask each of them. So the next is, are links available that list designers and contractors who have experience with installing home sprinkler systems? At this point, HFSC does not provide that information. What we do is we do get a lot of people who ask us for especially qualified sprinkler contractors, and we do send them to two of our founding members, board members, and that is AFSA and NFSA. And both, um, both of those groups do have searches on their websites where you can put in, um, I believe in both cases, the zip code or the name of the town, and then it'll let you know who their contractors are, their members that do 13D work. Right. Awesome. This and, next and is, and this is um, I'm sorry, uh, Susan, this is probably oh, ahead, just, to, just to interject one thing. Uh, we actually do also include a number of various case studies on the Fire Sprinkler Initiative website that includes a number of pro sprinkler builders and developers that have either worked with their fire service or other sprinkler advocates in their neck of the woods and have pretty much seen the light. And we have those case studies. I'm going to put the link in the chat box right chat box right now. Um, one specifically we linked up with was a South Carolina um, developer who, who worked with his fire department there and was able to sprinkler all the new homes in his community, about 140 of them, for about a dollar a square foot. So they're out there. We have a number of case studies, studies supporting that. 
Thanks and I'm so going to put much. that link in the chat box. Thanks. Thanks so much, Fred. And the next is a comment. One of the participants wrote, it is frustrating that in Connecticut there are two major impediments to installation of residential sprinkler systems. One impediment is that water purveyors resist it and have their own rules. And two, unions will not allow plumbers to install residential systems. Well, unfortunately, um, the water purveyors, they, as I said, in some markets, they have been a bigger challenge than home builders. Um, we, the coalition did put together a water guide, and it is a video and a brochure on our website to try and educate them. Um, I do understand that oftentimes, even when they're educated, you still have resistance. And I probably hear it more from the private water companies. Um, there was a case a few years ago that, that HFSC talked about, and it was a mom who was trying to sprinkler her home in Ohio because she had a daughter with a disability, and the, the tap fee that the private water company wanted to charge her was outrageous. In the end, she ended up putting in a tank and pump just so she could avoid hooking up to the, the city water supply. And, um, you know, that's how she dealt with that. But, you know, I don't have an answer outside of, um, you know, trying to educate them. And we had a, a participant who had a comment about that saying that water purveyors are concerned that if they have to shut off the water due to lack of payment, that they would then be liable for shutting off the sprinkler system in the event of a fire. Yes, we do hear that quite a bit, and the way it's explained to me, and I am not a legal person, is um, once the water's off, like any of the utilities, technically the homeowner's not supposed to be living in the home, and so, um, you know, I don't know the law or the rules, but that is how it was explained to me, was once it's shut off, technically they shouldn't be living in the home. Okay, thank you so much. And our next question, uh, Eric, I might need you to give some clarification for Eric Gleason. I just pasted your question in the chat window. And I'm wondering uh, if you could clarify that just a little bit, if Peg needed Peg. This might be straightforward to you. So um, it's, uh, Eric just asked if you could speak to the idea of overdoing the intent of 13B slash 2904 by requiring water flow BFPD and horn strobe. Again, um, that would probably be a good question for Matt Klaus to answer. Okay. An FPA. All right, awesome. And then. Um, let's see, we had a comment that says costs of residential sprinklers rise dramatically if the plumbers cannot install them. That kind of goes along with what you were mentioning a moment ago. And let's see. And then we have, from a volume standpoint, specifications for home builders uh, that they install systems with a number of fire chiefs for their personal and children's homes. So it sounds like the intent of that was, uh, you know, maybe ways to collaborate, if I'm understanding that accurately, that kind of ties in with what you were saying about maybe other ways to educate folks and, you know, other approaches maybe. But we have a, the next question is, just this is a point to consider from Ira, how many gallons of water are used to put out a fire in a sprinkler home versus the thousands of gallons used to put out the fire in a non-sprinkler home? Yes, and we actually have some nice graphics on our website that um, does help educate on that. Um, sprinklers use an average of about 13 to 15 gallons per minute versus one firefighter hose that uses about 250 gallons. And so we do have a graphic, again, that anyone is welcome to use that um, shows the difference between 13 gallons a minute and um, 250. And um, oftentimes I know two lines may be used on a typical house fire, so then it's 500 gallons per minute. So 
um, please go to our website and use use that information. Okay, thanks, Peg. We had a few questions and comments come in uh, during this section. So let's see, we have a comment that says Washington State passed a law to limit liability for water purveyors if they turn off a system due to non-payment. Perhaps other states have similar laws. And then let's see. Um, well, that kind of answers the earlier question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and then regarding water purveyors shutting off water and homeowners needing to evacuate the house, this does not answer the question, but what if the house burns down with no one in it? Well, that brings up an interesting Another point because the, per the, the, the purpose of an NFPA 13D system, and, and I'm glad that that question came up because this is something I should have said, but I think um, most of us know the whole purpose of NFPA 13D is life safety. It is not um, to protect the home. That just happens to be a wonderful benefit. So 13D is designed to give occupants 10 minutes to get out of their home to save their lives. Well, thanks, Peg. And then we have. I'm gonna I'm gonna paste this in our chat window, Peg, as well. It, it might be a little to, hard to follow just by my reading it verbally. P2904 does not require a water flow alarm, backflow, or notification device. Those would be a local amendment, and then mentions local. AHJ in California attempts to require them. Um, I don't see a question in that, but um, that is true, and that's the same with um, 13D. It does not require those um, items as well, and um, there are homeowners that choose to put the alarm system on. Um, and there are a lot of local jurisdictions who add it to the requirements. So, no, it's not um, part of either the ICC or NFPA code, but it is um, our standard. Um, but yes, there are a lot of jurisdictions who will add it, or builders will choose to add it, or homeowners want it. Okay, thanks so much, Peg. Those were all the questions and comments. I know, Fred, you uh, said that you had some information to share as well before we do the closing comments. Sure, and thanks to everyone for the questions and comments. And we will be posting all of this material again on the Fire Sprinkler ne Initiative website in the, up in the upcoming weeks, including questions, comments, as well as maybe some more clarification on all the issues. Um, one quick thing, the best way to really stay up to date on any sort of sprinkler news taking place across the uh, not only the US but Canada and any new HFFC resources, please subscribe if you haven't done so already um, to the Fire Sprinkler Initiative um, newsletter, and I'll place that link into the chat box as well right now. Um, it's sent monthly. Uh, it goes directly to your inbox, and again, includes a nice array of, of sprinkler news and resources that you might find helpful during your advocacy work. Thank you so much. If all of you could stay on just a few more minutes, I'll give you some closing information that can help you after we depart. This webinar does not offer CEUs, however, you will receive a certificate of attendance for being here today. Please return to your NFP prof NFPA profile and click over to your course site, and then you'll see the certificate is available for printing. If you have additional questions or comments, feel free to send an email to custserve at nfpa.org. As we mentioned earlier, a recording will be available in approximately three weeks, as well as a PDF and answers to today's questions at firesprinklerinitiative.org. I want to thank you especially for your wonderful participation. I really love when we have sessions like this in which participants are helping each other and sharing information back and forth. It makes it extra good for everybody. On behalf of our sponsor, the National Fire Protection Association Fire Sprinkler Initiative, the National Fire Protection Association, Home Fire Sprinkler Coalition, 
Peg, Fred, and myself. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Have a good rest of the day.